Fannie loses again. Judge McAfee comes out, drops a ruling, but not the ruling. We're still waiting for the big one. The disqualification and the dismissal opinion from Judge Scott McAfee out of Fulton County. But this is a good one. Six counts that were originally brought in Fannie Willis's prosecution, now gone. Why? Because Fannie and Nathan didn't know how to write an indictment. They just made broad, vague terms and said, you violated your oath. And what oath? There's a lot of oaths. There's a lot of things that could be in that. So you need a little bit more specificity. And because you didn't have that, they're gone. And the charges we're talking about include that perfect phone call. We're going to see what is now gone. We're also going to see what is left as we break down what remains in the Trump indictment before we get reaction from Trump's lawyer, Raskin and Raffensberger. But let's go right to the opinion. Judge McAfee dropping this, catching everybody by surprise. Everybody's inbox went, er, and everybody thought, oh, Judge McAfee, a new opinion. Is this the disqualification one? Not quite yet, but we're on the way there. And the question is, what does the this do to that other opinion? Are these two things that are completely separate and apart from one another? Does this decision have some bearing, some weight on the other decision that we're still waiting to drop? Are they correlated or not? We'll see. We've got some analysis coming up on that. We'll come back to. But here's what happened. 923 in the morning as we sit and wait for the other decision to drop. State of Georgia versus Donald Trump and the co-defendants. Fulton County, of course, Prosecutor Fannie Willis, they're representing the government. This is Judge McAfee writing, saying, all right, the defendants, Trump, and these other defendants who all filed or joined these motions, they challenge counts 2, 5, 6, 23, 28, and 38 of the indictment by way of a special demur. Now, what the judge is telling us, and we're going to understand what a demur is, it's basically saying that the underlying charges are invalid because they're not specific enough and they got to be specific so that the defense can properly prepare a defense. You just say, well, you broke the law generally. You're like, okay, you need some specificity. So they say here, these are the people involved, obviously, Trump, Giuliani, Eastman, Meadows, Smith, and Chile all submitting directly or through adoption an effort to get rid of those six charges. Now, before we understand what a demur is, let's talk about the charges because I think the charges, if we know what the charges are, we'll see how a demur applies to this. So what we have from Anna Bauer, who is a great reporter doing great work at Anna Bauer on the X platform, she put together this summation of the charges. You can see that there are these six counts listed. She writes, these are the charges dismissed in the Fulton County election interference case. So we're asking ourselves about the nature of these charges. Okay, what type of charge are they? We've got six different charges with different co-defendants. So Giuliani, Eastman, and Smith on the first one. The charges are Eastman, Smith, and Giuliani. They were soliciting a public officer to violate their oath. So we're going to see that same pattern. So just come back to that. Officers violating their oath. Okay, well, their oath is, you know, to uphold, defend the Constitution, whatever. So that's a pretty big one. You know, anything like in the oath, like to uphold the law, does that mean a traffic ticket? or how did they do the oath? What part of the oath? Give us some details. So anyways, they say, this is what Fannie said originally. December 3rd, there was a state meeting, Georgia State Capitol, Rudy Giuliani, Eastman, they show up and they're asking public officers, right, at the hearing, so it's a public hearing or whatever the hearing was, maybe it was a meeting, said, hey, we've got an alternative theory. You should have an investigation into this. So they said that they were asking them, soliciting them to violate their oath. They also charged Trump with doing the same thing, soliciting a public officer to violate their oath because because he placed a phone call, not the perfect call, to Georgia House Speaker David Ralston. So Trump calls, says, hey, listen, you know, we've got this a theory that there's another outcome here and we're investigating. So this is what the House should do, right? Trump's investigating. Count six, also going to be going away. But this again was Giuliani and Smith, again, soliciting a public officer to violate their oath. This was a different meeting. Giuliani, Smith, several other people who were not indicted, they held a meeting at the Georgia House of Representatives and its Governmental Affairs Committee. So they show up, say, hey, we've got this alternate theory. You should do something about it. Fanny says that that do something about it is a violation of their oath and they were soliciting somebody to do that. 23. All three people, Giuliani, Smith, and Sheely, charged with soliciting a public officer. There was another meeting, this time in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee in Georgia. 28. Trump and Meadows. Now this is the big one. Count 28 charges both Trump and Meadows with soliciting a public officer to violate their oath. And that was during the infamous, quote, perfect phone call that Trump and Meadows held with Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, the so-called find me the votes call, which was perfect. So that was again soliciting an officer. Trump was doing the soliciting of an officer to violate their oath, whatever that oath was. Count 38 charges Trump again with sending a letter. This time was another letter encouraging Brad Raffensperger, again, the secretary to decertify the election or quote, whatever the correct legal remedy is and announce the true winner. So saying, look, you're the secretary, go investigate this stuff and then announce the true winner of this since you know your elections are terrible. 
level. And they are, by the way. I mean, we've seen it. Amy Totenberg, who is not a MAGA judge by any way, shape, or form, already wrote an opinion in another case there in Georgia saying your elections are terrible. This started back in 2018, has been going on ever since. All right, but the pattern you see is it's they're asking a public official to violate their oath of office. So what does that mean? Let's see. The judge now is considering those charges. And he's saying that a demur that came from all of the defendants who were charged with those types of crimes, it provides a means for the criminally accused to ensure that the state's charging document satisfies the constitutional mandates of due process and the Sixth Amendment. And they say here, right, under the U.S. Constitution, the accused shall enjoy the right to be informed of the nature and the cause of the accusation. If you are charged with a crime, you want to know the details of the crime. If they say you're charged with murder, they say to you, okay, well, you killed this person on this date and time. This was the weapon used. Here's the theory of the case. Here are the witnesses that come after you, all the things. Think about it. If it would have just been, you broke the law, you're arrested. You go to jail forever. For what? You know, whatever we say, because we're the government. We don't have to give you due process. We don't have to give you notice of the charges, the right to contest them, the right to confront your accusers or any of those things, right? There was a time and place before we had a written constitution where that was the norm. You just got arrested, thrown in the gulag somewhere, and that was that. And I think a lot of people in this country would like to go back to those days, and they don't like due process. But the point here is that Fannie was just saying that they violated some random oath. And we can't know the nature and the cause of the accusation by just pointing to some platitude like that. You violated your oath. Okay, how? And what part of the oath? And what did I do? A special demur challenges the form of the indictment. So this is what the defense Trump's team and others did. They claim that the defense is entitled to additional information or specificity. And there's another case that requires the offense be stated with sufficient certainty. So if Trump wants to rebut that they asked somebody to violate their oath, they need to know what the violation was. So they say pre-trial, this is Judge McAfee writing, pre-trial, a charging document is expected to be, quote, perfect in form as well as substance. McAfee says the challenged language of an indictment should be interpreted liberally in favor of the state with any objections strictly construed against the defendant. Talking about who has the burden here. Now, despite this, right, so we don't want, in other words, a defendant to come in and just say, oh, that's not detailed enough. Okay, I needed to know what weapon it was. I needed to know what the caliber of the you know bullet was. I need to know who, you know, all the details. And it, because you didn't specify that in the indictment, it has to be dismissed. No, 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 it's not that strict. But you got to have some details. Now, any objection strictly construed against the defendant. Now, despite this, they say, a pretrial challenge does not require a showing of prejudice. And the trial court should examine the indictment from the perspective that the accused is innocent. So when I'm weighing all of this, like I do have rules, I can't just say, okay, you know, anything that's a minor detail. Oh, sorry, indictment's dismissed. No. But when the defense does object, I'm going to look at it and look at it through a lens that presumes that the defendant is innocent because, of course, we have the presumption of innocence in this country for the time being. So in other words, let's say that you just were walking down the street. Some, you know, cop says, hey, Rob, you're under arrest. You're coming with us. What charges? You have literally no idea what's going on. They, you're arrested for murder. What? I was doing the show. If I had zero knowledge, I would need enough to be able to prepare my defense. Okay, who? Who's dead? And where did it happen? What? Give me some details. So presume that the defendant is completely blank, right? Lacking any knowledge of any incriminating facts that were alleged by the government. They say, here's what our appellate courts have provided. This is a well-used standard for evaluating this. So Trump's team says, you're just pointing to some vague oath that was violated, but we need more. Here's the test according to Georgia law. They say the test is not whether the indictment could have been made more definite and certain, because obviously you could always have that, right? That's kind of an impossible standard. Could it have been more specific? Yeah, I mean, it always could have. That's not the test. The test is whether it contains the element of the offense intended to be charged, and it sufficiently apprises the defense of what he must be prepared to meet so that they know what they have to defend against. And in any case, any other proceedings are taking against him in a similar offense, whether the record shows with accuracy to what extent he may plead a formal acquittal or conviction. So it's about notice and process. So here he gives us an analogy. He says, let's use a civil analogy. A special demur is akin to a motion for a more definite statement or a bill of particulars, right? It's what's specific in the indictment. Now, the ultimate purpose is to put the defendant on notice so that they know what they've been charged with and it's to protect against double jeopardy. So the state is very clear. We're charging you for this specifically, this date and time, this location, this venue, these are the elements of the offense you're guilty so that another person can't charge a similar crime and hit you twice. Now they tell us due process is satisfied where the indictment puts the defense on notice of the crimes with which he or she is charged and against which he must defend. Now they're pointing us to 
footnote two, and here's what that says. They say the defendants here highlight this frequently cited provision to argue that an indictment must score a flawless 100% on a graded scale. Now, the origin of this legal phrase does not appear to set such a high bar, limiting perfection only to time and place. Okay, so time and place have to be like, you know, dead accurate according to Georgia law, 1877. And as the Georgia Supreme Court has pointed out, imperfections in the indictment are regularly overlooked when an indictment contains an immaterial defect such as a misnamed code section, the misspelling of a drug. Think about that, right? They come in, they're like, you're charged with possession of meth am schmetamine. You're like, the heck I am. I'm not charged with possession of meth am schmetamine. I don't know what the heck that is. Not me though. And you go all the way to trial and you go all the way up and you know, you have your whole case presented and they say, and that's why you should find him guilty of methamphetamine possession. And he says, sorry, your indictment says methamphetamine schmetamine. You go, Pfft. innocent, right? And there's validity to some of those arguments, right? At times they'll cite the different code section, not a misnamed code section, but a different code section. They'll charge you under one theory and another theory. So these things absolutely matter, which is why obviously there's case law on this there. You know, at some point somebody said, they charged me with meth am schmetamine. There's no such drug, you know, and that had to be appealed. So the misspelling of a drug or even the alleged date of the crime in some cases, indicating that perfection may be more of an aspirational statement than an exact working standard. So there's some case law, some judge somewhere in Georgia said, it needs to be a hundred percent, you know, so awesome judge sounds like he's right. You know, pro-defense government's terrible. It says it gotta be flawless. They walked it back. No, it's only about the time and place. And as long as it's immaterial, then some of the mistakes can be papered over. So he says, okay, so that's the background. So you file a demur. We have some rules now. It's not about whether it's perfect. It's just whether about the defense can properly defend themselves because that's due process. Now turning to the indictment itself, Judge McAfee continues. He says these six challenged counts that we reviewed charge various defendants with solicitation. So they're asking for a public officer to violate their oath. He says, well, the crime of violation of oath by public officer, here's what it says. It prohibits any public officer from willfully and intentionally violating the terms of his or her oath as prescribed by law. Very vague. Now the term of the oath alleged to have been violated, it must be quote expressly prescribed, meaning it is explicitly contained in the applicable statutory provisions. So it's not just some vague, generic, you asked them to violate their oath. I did? How? I was just saying, can you please make sure your election's not rigged? Sorry, you asked them to violate their oath. Where? What did I do specifically that was asking them to be criminal? Fanny didn't do that. She didn't plead that. She was too busy indicting Nathan Wade. So here's this case from Georgia. It reversed when a police officer's oath did not expressly include a provision to uphold the state law. Now the state must also, more case law, saying the state must present evidence that the defendant violated the terms of the oath actually administered and that those terms were from an oath prescribed by law. So here, another indictment withstood a general demur by specifying the violated term, getting some details. So it's tightening the rule. You can't just point to some vague abstract concept. And criminal solicitation, the law itself, 1647 under Georgia, it prohibits one from intentionally soliciting, requesting, commanding, importuning, or otherwise attempting to cause another person to engage in felony conduct, right? We're going to come back to that because the question is going to be, what was the felony conduct, right? It's a necessary element before you can build upon that with another charge of solicitation. You got to have the felony that you're asking about. Otherwise, you're just asking about something, you know, which way is the McDonald's? It's over this way. Okay, that's not a felony, right? That's soliciting information, but that's not a felonious solicitation. So the six counts are similarly structured and they can be summarized as follows. So here the judge tells us, he says, okay, count two, it says multiple defendants solicited elected members of the Georgia Senate to violate their oaths of office. Again, we don't really know how on December 3rd by requesting them to unlawfully appoint presidential electors. Count five says, alleges that Trump solicited the Speaker of the House of Representatives to violate his oath of office. And he did it by requesting him to call a special session to unlawfully appoint presidential electors. We're still talking about what part of the oath. Count six alleges that Smith and Giuliani also solicited members of Georgia to violate their oaths of office by requesting them to unlawfully appoint presidential electors. So conversations about an alternative theory these alternate electors, felonies, right? Poor Fanny. 23 says that defendants solicited elected members of Georgia's Senate to violate their oaths at a Senate hearing. 28, Trump and Meadows solicited Raffensperger by requesting him to violate his oath of office. And then they asked him again, Raffensperger, to decertify the election on September 17th. So that's the nature of what we're talking about, summarized by McAfee. So he continues, he says, defendants first argue, so Trump and co, they say they first argue that the indictment indictment is defective because the charging language does not cite the oath that each of these solicited
solicited public officers was required to take. So it wasn't specific enough that it gave the actual oath like verbatim. Okay, so it should have said that, you know, the Speaker of the House who Trump had a conversation with, what oath specifically did he take? They didn't reference that, meaning we can't see what the oath was, meaning we can't know what the possible violation was, so we can't defend ourselves, therefore it's facially invalid. That's their argument. Now he's saying, no, that doesn't cut it. That's not enough, okay? This omission is legally harmless, he says, as the code provides only one option relevant to each category of public official. So you can know what this oath was that the conduct allegedly violated by just looking it up. Each Georgia senator and representative, the law says, they must take the oath prescribed in 28-1-4. So you know that, so you could just go, okay, you want to see what the House of Representatives guy said? Go look at that one. Georgia senator, look at 28-1-4. The governor, you know, he takes an oath under 45-12-4, and the secretary takes one under 45-3-1. And so if you wanted to know what Brad did, like they didn't cite that he took an oath under 45-3-1, but you could have gone and found that. Now, without the possibility of alternative oaths, so the law says it's this, you don't get to choose, prescribed by the law, the court agrees with Fannie that the defense are sufficiently apprised, you have notice, you have due process, of which oath is issued in each indicted count. Now, in a supplemental filing submitted in February, Fannie and her office, they detail information provided in discovery concerning the exact oaths administered. They say the constitutionally sufficient notice provided by a sufficiently detailed indictment, this is McAfee says, may be supplemented by the pretrial discovery. Okay, so even if they didn't tell you at the outset in the indictment itself what the original oath was, they supplemented it. And they said, okay, this one exactly for Raffensperger, this one exactly for this guy, this one exactly for that guy. This observation, says McAfee, does not directly suggest that discovery, even if voluminous, is an adequate legal remedy to special demur. So it doesn't mean that you can just paper over it, right? If the indictment is problematic enough, you can't just dump a bunch of additional discovery on it to fix it. Nor is the defendant entitled to a bill of particulars with respect to information which is already available through other sources, such as an indictment or discovery or inspection. Judge writes, given the conclusion, though that only one oath exists for each relevant official, the court doesn't need to reach this argument, so we'll just leave it there. McAfee continues, there's only one option for each of them, and Trump's team, with a little bit of due diligence, could have discovered the option, learned about the oath, learned that they said that they violated that oath, and so that alone is not enough. McAfee continues, even if the relevant oaths are apparent as a matter of law, so you can just follow the ball, bouncing ball, go find them, the defense, Trump and co, they further contend that the counts in the indictment do not detail the exact term of the oaths that are alleged to have been violated. Hmm, those are big, long oaths. Hands up for a long time. I promised, and you know. The state first responds, right? So what part of the oath? Because you say that we broke broke the oath, so what part of the oath? Now we know what oath they took, but now we're talking about subsections and they're big oaths. And you need to know that if you're gonna defend the case. It's almost like you're asking them to violate another statute. So what part of that other statute? So the state says, you don't need to know all that. They respond, they say the defense are only charged with solicitation. Okay, so the only thing you need to know about is the asking. So they're soliciting a violation of the oath. So they ask, that's the conduct. Did they have the intent and the action of the ask and the meeting and so-called, that's enough evidence. They say you don't need to know any other evidence about the violation of the oath of office because that's between the office holder and the office. And they argue, so you don't need that information. They argue that the great weight of authority, this is McAfee writing, has never required charging language to reach beyond the elements of solicitation itself. So if we charge somebody with solicitation asking, you know, hey man, you have drugs for sale solicitation. Hey, you want to investigate this election? They say that's solicitation. But it's not about the ask itself. It's only about the consequences of the ask. It's limited to the person doing the asking. It's not about what the person who is being asked does. But they say, so that's what the government said. Fannie says, it's only, we're only charging with like this little part. Judge says, no, sorry. But Sanders, this case, it tells us that the elements of the underlying predicate felony that is alleged to have been solicited cannot be so easily ignored, right? That's like saying the guy who's asking a guy on the street for drugs, right? The reason that solicitation of drugs for sale is because it's illegal to ask for the drugs. If you solicit him for directions to the nearest restaurant, that's a different situation. So the underlying felony matters. You can't just ask about solicitation in and of itself. It's gotta be related to a predicate felony. The judge says, you can't ignore that. Not so fast, Big Fanny. In Sanders, the Georgia Supreme Court found a special demur should have been granted, meaning indictment goes bye-bye. When an indictment failed to sufficiently allege the underlying felony 
solicited by the defendant. So they just said he asked for something, but we don't really know why it was criminal for him to do the thing. In particular, for an allegation of solicitation of felony drug possession, the court found that the indictment should have averred the specific drug possessed and its quantity. You're getting charged with a solicitation of a drug, of a felony drug. Okay, what drug? Where? How much? Is it, you know, statutory threat? Is it a prescription drug? You know, I might have a prescription for that. So what is it? What kind of drug? Sorry, indicted for possession of drugs. What drug? Yeah, maybe I did have drugs, but maybe I had a prescription for them. There's a valid reason for that. Are you talking about Advil or aspirin? Like, what's the drug? What's the quantity? Otherwise, you cannot defend yourself. So without this information, the court said the defendant could not prepare the defense intelligently, of course, and the crime could be committed in a number of possible ways. Yeah, a lot of different illegal drugs out there. Some have prescriptions, some don't, and you don't even know, you know, where it came from. You say, maybe it's not me, you know, because you don't know what they're alleging, what it was or where it happened. Let's back up. They do tell us, however, the state, Fannie admits this, that Georgia appellate courts have only considered a single case applying a special demur to a criminal solicitation, a case which sustained the demur, okay? So there's basically no case law on this because only Fannie could botch an indictment so badly. All right. Only the hero prosecutor of America. Now, when charging other compound crimes, compound crimes like solicitation are those which rely on an underlying or predicate offense. And thank you, Judge, for educating the public and us here about what he's talking about. In other words, he knows this is here for public consumption. So an underlying or predicate offense like felony murder and felony murder, for example, is often referenced by the bank robbery example. So four guys go up, rob a bank. Three guys go in, give us all your money. Something goes bad. Someone gets shot and killed. Getaway driver, guess what? He's on the hook for murder because he was committing a felony and in the commission of a felony, someone died. So he gets charged with the murder, even though he didn't even go in the building because he was in commission of a felony. It's called felony murder and it's a common one. So the precedent says that you got to have an underlying predicate in order for it to be that felony that overlaps onto you. They say precedent is clear that the allegations must even either include every essential element of the predicate offense or charge the predicate offense as a separate count. So we know how to defend by getting specific on the elements. In other words, a naked charge of solicitation cannot survive unless it's accompanied by additional elements establishing the solicited felony. So you got to also talk about the drug possession or in this case, the oath violation. So they tell us, Judge McAfee continuing, he says all three statutory oaths that were taken that we referenced with some linguistic variation, they all have, a provision that the oath taker will also support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of Georgia. And you go, oh man, okay. So Fannie is saying you asked an officer to violate their oath. We got to know what's inside that oath. But the oath references the Constitution and not just one Constitution, but two. And you have to support and defend and uphold those two Constitutions. So now we're talking about like a whole library of possible conduct that's covered. Because, you know, the oath could be like, I swear I uphold to like never litter on the street, whatever that oath is. Okay, well, that's it. Okay. He took an oath against littering. You know, it, that's the only thing in there. So you can defend against littering if that's the example. Obviously, that's not the case. He's referencing some big oath plus the constitutions. So now we have, you know, encyclopedias worth of stuff that we could possibly be charged with. So the indictment, when Fanny charged this, when detailing the manner and the means of the criminal enterprise, which is the first RICO count, she describes that Trump and the defendants were were soliciting Georgia officials to, quote, to violate their oaths to Georgia and the Georgia Constitution and to the United States in the indictment. And so thus, if you read the indictment as a whole, which the trial court, that's me, Judge McAfee, saying that's what I'm required to do, it confirms that these are the prescribed terms at issue in the six challenged counts. So that's all we got, to violate their oaths to the Georgia Constitution and to the United States Constitution. So we got what's in their oath and how does that oath and what's the conduct, how does it relate to their oath? and to their protection of the constitutions. Judge McAfee continues, while averments do contain a reference to the terms of the violated oaths, this court finds that the incorporation of the constitutions of both the United States and Georgia is so generic as to compel this court to grant the special demurs. Gone. Sorry, Fanny. Losing again. Judge McAfee writes, on its own, the United States Constitution contains hundreds of clauses, any one of which can be the 
subject of a lifetime of study. Academics and litigators, they devote their entire careers to the specialization of a single amendment. And to further complicate this matter, the Georgia Constitution is not just a mere shadow of its federal constitution. And although some provisions feature similar language, the Georgia Constitution has been interpreted to contain dramatically different meanings. And this is in marked contrast with, say, you know, aggravated assault with a handgun, which can be perpetrated in only a limited number of ways, right? Do you have a handgun or not? If you have a knife, you know, it's different. It's not the same statute. So if the defense comes back and says, well, is it a Glock though, or is it a SIG? And if you go, well, that's not specific enough, they say, no, it is. Okay, you know what it is. You can make those arguments in your defense, but at least you know it's a handgun. In only a limited number of ways, and an indictment that merely refers to a handgun is not too vague because it infers that the weapon used was either a firearm or as a bludgeon. So a handgun, right, you use it as a weapon to hit someone with or you shoot them with it. So the court continues McAfee throwing Fanny's six terrible counts out. Says the court's concern is less that the state has failed to allege sufficient conduct of the defendants. In fact, it has alleged an abundance. There's a ton of conduct all throughout the indictment. There's all these overt acts in there. However, that's not the concern. The lack of detail concerning an essential legal element is, in the judge's opinion, undersigned on this opinion, is fatal. Womp womp. Sorry, Fanny. As written, these six counts contain all the essential elements of the crimes, but they fail to allege sufficient detail regarding the nature of their commission. What was the underlying felony that was solicited? Don't know. They do not give the defendants enough information to prepare their defense intelligently, as the defendants could have violated the constitutions and thus the statute in dozens, if not hundreds, of distinct ways, obviously. Now, under the standards articulated by our appellate courts, the special demur must be granted, and Judge McAfee says, counts 2, 5, 6, 23, 28, and 38 must be quashed. Fanny loses. Now, they say the state Fanny's office also cited to Wiggins, saying that this makes this a closer call, but does not change the result. The indictment in Wiggins may not have listed the specific, quote, crime against the state that the defendant committed in violation of his oath, but it did include enough detail to create a much smaller universe of possibilities, in contrast to the reference in this indictment that incorporates both the entire state and federal constitutions. So it's almost like you just violated the law. I need to know what law. The Constitution. What? I need more than that. So they must be quashed, but the judge is careful. He says, so they're quashed, okay? But this does not mean the entire indictment is dismissed. The state may also seek a re-indictment supplementing these six counts. So Fannie can go back to the drawing board, reconvene that grand jury, and fix this indictment. Of course, that's going to beg the question, how quickly can they do that? And once this new indictment drops with the new charges, Trump's team is going to say, well, we need a lot more time now. These are whole new charges. We just got re-indicted. We need another six months to prepare our defense against these new charges because they're going to be new charges, right? Because these are gone. So it's going to come back and we'll have a second bite at the apple if Fannie decides to go this route. Judge says, even if the statute of limitations has expired, the state gets a six months extension from the date of this order to resubmit this case to a grand jury. Nor is it inevitable, presuming the state presents the appropriate motion, that the identity of future grand jurors will be publicly accessible. Now, this is an area of law where federal courts have achieved greater efficiency, and one might wish that future grand jurors could be spared this inconvenience for something so easily remedied. And maybe the law would allow them, right, allowing the government filing a bill of particulars to inform a defendant of the charges in sufficient details to minimize surprise at trial. But Georgia law provides no option, right? So Georgia says, sorry, like the law says you can't do that. This case from 1988 says a bill of particulars is not a recognized pleading. So you got to do it again. So prosecutors in Georgia have it a little, you know, tough. They can't just slap on a bill of particular. They've got to go and fix your indictment. That's why you need experienced people to bring indictments like this on a national case. Maybe Fanny shouldn't have hired her boyfriend. Now, alternatively, the state may request a certificate of immediate review. You can appeal this, which the court would likely grant to the lack of any precedential authority. If you want to take this up on appeal, feel free to do it. I'll allow you to, because what do I know? The courts of appeals should decide this, because it's a new issue. This is my take on it, but maybe they find differently. Now, defendant Cheely goes further, and he also claims that count 23 also fails because there's no nexus between the offense and the public officers. Now, this court disagrees and finds that the Georgia Senate can play a role in the election contests and that the appointment of presidential electors does relate to their official duties. So the reason that Chile says 23 goes away is not accepted by the court, even though the count goes away for another reason. Saying, however, these pleading deficiencies do not apply to the core 
corresponding overt acts, right? So in the original indictment, there's the charges and then there's a list of overt acts in furtherance of the conspiracy under count one. And so they're alleging a broad conspiracy. And so those overt acts like the Raffensperger phone call could be relevant to proving, you know, another part of the case. But this charge in and of itself is not a part of the case any longer. So it could be used for another charge, but not this one. Now, overt acts alleged as part of a conspiracy are not held to the same pleading standards as statutorily based offenses. So conspiracy gives her a little bit more leeway because she can prove the conspiracy with a little bit more evidence. Now, instead, all that is required is a reference to the overt act alleged by the state. And even then, a defendant can be found guilty of conspiracy even after acquittal of any overt acts alleged to have been committed by that defendant as long as at least one overt act is proven to have been committed by a co-conspirator. So it's right. Conspiracy cases are tough because of that. If you just have one act in furtherance of the conspiracy, that's enough, right? And then you got disavowal and withdrawing from the conspiracies and it gets complex. But point is here, the overt acts can stay because she is still pleading conspiracy and you know those also don't have to go. Now, there were some questions about whether the phone call was legally recorded. And that's another issue that can come up later down the line because if the phone call was illegal, then we have questions about fruit of the poisonous tree and whether all of that evidence should be precluded when the case goes to trial, but we're not there yet. This is just even on the indictment, right? The indictment is bad. You have written it poorly and it's not specific enough to give the defense what they need. So it's got to go. McAfee wraps it up. He says, defendants have not provided any authority requiring that the overt acts go. And so they don't. So their challenge of the overt acts is therefore denied. Those stay in the indictment, even though the charges go away, which is really what, you know, those overt acts were in there to go after the charges. So they might use those overt acts for the other charges, but the big one is gone. So ordered by Judge Scott McAfee in a very nice opinion, March 13th, 2024, Fulton County Superior Court, well-reasoned and a good decision for the defense in this case. Now, there are charges that remain. And so as we see, six charges were dismissed, two, five, six, 23, 28, 38 are gone. Trump still has 10 charges remaining. And let me give you just a snapshot of what these look like. So there's a lot here, but this is how it is broken down. So once again, this is the conspiracy charge. This is count one. It says all these people were involved in a conspiracy, right? They were all unlawfully conspiring to directly conduct an enterprise, a racketeering enterprise for the purpose set forth herein, violating Georgia law. We also have this other bundle. So they were, are bundling up the different documents. So Trump and all these other people were charged with alternate electors violations. So there's another conspiracy, conspiracy to commit impersonating a public officer. So they went and tried to become those alternate electors. So that charge is still active. And then as a result of that conspiracy, there were many other document charges. And so you can see they basically just signed this document, right? This is a felony. So they conspired to file, enter, and record a document. The name of this document was called Certificate of the Votes of the 2020 Electors from Georgia. They said, we, the undersigned, signed this document illegal. Okay, all of them charged because they were on that document. Same thing happens here, saying that they proffered this forward. That's illegal. Same document and another charge of the same document by actually submitting it. They used and used a false document with knowledge that it was false. And they brought that in. They gave it to the Secretary of State. Okay, so they created a document. They signed a document. They submitted the document. Felony, felony, felony. All the creation of that one document creates a conspiracy. So it's bundled up into that chart, right? That's what's left. What else is left? There was another document they wrote. It's about notice of filling the electoral college vacancy. So here is another conspiracy. And then again, they sign their names to that document. And so that is another charge. We also have Trump submitted a filing in court, which is a crime, according to Fannie Willis. So he made the case in Trump versus Kemp. He submitted motion, a verified complaint for emergency injunction and declaratory relief. So Trump filed a lawsuit. That's a felony crime. That's a charge. He made these false statements, you know, felons voted, underage people were there, individuals, blah, blah, blah. Fannie said that's all false and fraudulent felony. And then Trump sent letters to Brad Raffensperger, two felonies for that. So that's what's left. These are all arguments that the election was rigged and that people who are responsible for governing the election should investigate it. So two felonies, 29 and 39 for sending stuff over to Brad Raffensperger. Those are the only things that are left and they're all, you know, largely related to a legitimate investigation that should all be dismissed. And we hopefully see that they will. This is what Steve Sadow said in response to the six charges being dismissed. Of course, we've got 10 left, but here's what this sounds like. Here is Steve Sadow. He, of course, is lead counsel for President Trump doing an awesome job. You should be following him at Steve Sadow on X. He said, 
the court made the correct legal decision to grant the special demurs and to quash important counts of the indictment brought by DA Fannie. The counts dismissed against President Trump are 528 and 38, which falsely claim that he solicited Georgia public officials to violate their oath of office, saying this ruling is the correct application of the law as the prosecution failed to make specific allegations of any alleged wrongdoing in those counts. The entire prosecution of President Trump is political. It constitutes election interference and it should be dismissed. And Sadow's right about that. We're going to wake up and ask ourselves what happened in 2024 if things don't go our way and people are going to be looking to election interference and saying what happened on election day whereas we're living election interference every single day here as we march towards November. Here is Jamie Raskin. He was asked about this and he He's, you know, he says that the law is the law and he's just going to follow the process. He says he's not concerned about the judge's partial dismissal, rather. Listen. That to me is a reflection of the rule of law. I mean, without opining on the specific dismissal. I mean, I don't get upset when Trump's team yes, wins a motion in civil or criminal court. That is the rule of law in the justice system. Yes, you do, Jamie. You're going to be very upset about it tonight. We know you're going to probably introduce some new legislation to maybe decertify another election or something. This is Raffensperger, Brad Raffensperger, of course, he was the guy on the other end of the phone call and he was there answering questions from the media. There's a lot of noisy fuzz on this one because they had a cable that was loose. But here is what Raffensperger was asked, not about this recent opinion, but about the 2024 election. Trump's back on the ballot. He's like, oh gosh, Trump again? Oh no. Sir, this will be the first time that Donald Trump's name is on a ballot in Georgia since the 2020 election. Given all that you and your family have been through since that time. Do you have any Give me a break. The fact that by the end of the day, he could clinch the GOP nomination for president? Well, I think it's kind of seen this all coming down the road. He's been performing well in just about every state. He's won, except a couple. There were several candidates in there, but at the end of the day, he won out. That's how it looks like it's going to end up today, but I'm not making a prediction on that. Just like on the other side, there was a couple of folks that ran against the incumbent president, President Biden, and they all have now suspended their campaigns. So it kind of gets baked in there, as I said earlier, and it is what it is. And now we're just going to have about seven and a half months of campaigning. And I think that's going to wear everyone out, no matter what side of the aisle you're on. It is what it is. Well, our job is to really be prepared, prepared for a big turnout. Because back in 2020, we told everyone we we're going to have a big turnout. We didn't know we we're going to get 5 million people. But if we had 5 million in 2020, or I water think main breaks. Change. I think we still have, you know, both political camps are in their corners and it's going to be a very contested election. So I expect a big turnout, you know, November 2024. So we're going to probably tell our folks, prepare for six. We don't expect six. If you did show all, but we did have six, would we be prepared for that so we keep those lines short. I think that was a tremendous thing when we added into state law. Lines have to be shorter than one hour. You keep lines short to get those results posted quickly. Shorter that than one hour. That gives voters confidence. Just because, wow, they do things so efficiently. I can really trust the process. Yes, but we also have a verifiable paper ballot. Also, the General Assembly did put in additional audits. We're going to do that. And so we're, uh, we're prepared for any contingency. We've got a great team up and down the line. No, you do not, okay? Judge Amy Totenberg said it's a disaster over there, and it's going to be madness. Last time they had a water main break that we all remember. We went to bed. Georgia was in the can for Trump. We woke up and the votes went like this. Whoop, whoop. And they said, oh, no, no, you guys are just foolish. That was just the red mirage. Sure. Even the news anchors couldn't believe it. So my friends, good news on the day from the court. Judge McAfee finding that Fanny loses again. She's having a terrible showing. Remember, zero convictions. Okay. Four people took guilty pleas, but that does not mean a conviction. Their cases have been held in abeyance. And as long as Sidney Powell, Jenna Ellis, Kenneth Chesabro, and Scott Hall, as long as they complete their probation, their charges get dismissed. There is zero conviction. It's as though they never were charged. It is gone, right, off their record. It is a diversion deal. It's not even a conviction at all. So that's just a mistake that the other side is making. And we also know that Fannie lost big time when she tried to get Harrison Floyd incarcerated again at his bond revocation hearing, and she blew that one too. And they can't even properly indict defendants in one of the biggest cases in this nation's history because they're incompetent. They were too busy indicting each other, flying around Napa Valley, going on their various cruises, and now we can see what's happening as this is all laid out before us. And so we're going to be covering Fanny's case and the rest of them, my friends. Hopefully you're joining us and subscribing as we do. And thank you for inviting someone to come over here and join us. Have them come and check out the show so they can see some of the madness going on behind the scenes. We also have some great links down in the description below. Want to invite you to come to an event at WatcherLodge.com. Absolutely awesome event coming up this Saturday. Click over to check that one out. RobertGovea.com if you want to download the PDF we just went through. And of course, watching the watchers.locals.com where we have our members only streams in the morning and Saturday show. We'd love to have you join us and we'll see you back here on the next one. 